Have you ever stopped to consider what kind of world the forefathers of our Christian faith lived in and what it was like to be a follower of Christ at a time when his message was still new and life-changing? This world was deeply divided, with tensions simmering just below the surface and the threat of violence always looming. For the early Christians, life was a constant struggle. They faced persecution and death for their beliefs, yet they continued to cling to their faith with unwavering conviction. They saw in the teachings of Jesus Christ a hope, a promise of a better world to come, looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God, and they were willing to risk everything in service to their Lord and Savior. Their world was one of great hardship, but also great beauty and possibility. Amid all the chaos and darkness, there were moments of profound joy and love as the Christian community came together to support one another, share in the blessings of life, and worship the triune God together. The background of this world with the church in its infancy, the Roman Empire, and the Jewish religious system. My name is Jared Luchibor, a graduate of Mid-America Reform Seminary and a lover of church history. Join me as I step back in time to explore this world of the early Christians, a world whose culture served as the incubator from whence Christ's church was born. Scripture says at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. The question we must ask ourselves is what did this time look like? And why does it matter to me? Welcome to season one of the Church History Project. Our story begins with a backdrop of blood and glory the Roman Empire. This mighty civilization stretched from Britain to Egypt, Spain to Syria, encompassing diverse peoples and cultures under its rule. It was a world of order and law, but also of violence and oppression. In this world, a new faith was born, one that would challenge the power and authority of Rome, an authority that was placed solely on one man, the emperor. But Rome wasn't always like this. Founded in 753 BC, for two glorious centuries, Rome was ruled by kings who brought civilization and prosperity to the city on the Tiber River. But in 509 BC, everything changed. A series of political revolutions ended with a brutal tyrant named Tarquin the Proud. His son violated the honor of a noblewoman and provoked a popular uprising that overthrew his dynasty. The Romans vowed never to be enslaved by a single ruler again. They established a republic where power was shared among those in the Senate, the heart and soul of the Roman Republic, the assembly of nobles who guided and guarded the city's destiny. Thus began a new era of freedom and glory for Rome. From the dawn of the third century before Christ, Rome's ambition knew no bounds. She waged war after war, crushing her enemies and forging alliances until she claimed the entire Mediterranean as her domain. No land was too far, no foe too formidable for her legions of iron and steel. She encountered the cultured Greeks of the south, the fierce Gauls of the north, and the rich Carthaginians of the west. She faced Hannibal's elephants across the Alps and Scipio's triumph in Africa. She brought civilization and order to the barbaric tribes of Spain and plundered their mines of silver and gold. She was the mistress of the world, and none could challenge her might. But then the Republic was shattered by a storm of blood and fire. A succession of brutal civil wars in the first century before Christ tore apart society's fabric and unleashed a chaos and violence. Only a mighty ruler could quell the flames and restore peace and order to the broken land. He was born into a noble family, but had to fight for his destiny. He rose from a young soldier to a brilliant general, conquering lands and hearts with charisma and courage. He defied the Senate and crossed the Rubicon, sparking a civil war that made him the master of Rome. He reformed the laws and the calendar. He was loved by the people, envied by his rivals, and feared by his enemies. But he was not invincible. He had a flaw, his ambition for power, and that was his downfall. For some of his closest friends and allies turned against him, plotting his demise in the name of the Republic. They stabbed him in the Senate House in 44 BC, on the Ides of March, with daggers dipped in betrayal. He fell to the ground, bleeding, dying. He was Julius Caesar, the greatest man of his age, and the most tragic.
They thought they had saved the Republic. They thought they had struck down a tyrant. They thought they had restored liberty and justice to Rome. They were wrong. The death of Julius Caesar did not end his ambition or legacy. It only ignited a new flame of war and vengeance that would consume the world in its fury. For Caesar had left behind a son, not by blood, but by adoption. A young man named Octavius inherited his name and his fortune. A young man who would not let his father's murderers go unpunished. A young man who would stop at nothing to claim his rightful place as the heir of Caesar. Octavius was not alone in his quest. He had allies, powerful and cunning. Mark Antony, Caesar's loyal friend and general, who rallied the masses with his fiery speech. Lepidus, a Roman general and statesman. Together they formed what was called the Second Triumvirate, a formidable coalition that declared war on the assassins and their supporters. Brutus and Cassius, the leaders of the conspiracy, fought bravely but hopelessly against the overwhelming forces of the Triumvirs. They met their end at Philippi, where they fell on their own swords rather than face capture. Their followers were hunted down, executed, or forced to flee into exile. But the Triumvirs did not share the same vision for Rome. They soon turned against each other, driven by greed and jealousy. Antony fell in love with Cleopatra, the queen of Egypt, and abandoned his wife Octavia, the sister of Octavius. He also claimed dominion over the eastern provinces and challenged Octavius for supremacy in the west. Lepidus was sidelined and stripped of his power, accused of treason by Octavius. The final showdown came at Actium, where Octavius defeated Antony and Cleopatra in a naval battle. They fled to Alexandria, where they committed suicide rather than surrender. Octavius pursued them and conquered Egypt. Octavius was now the undisputed master of Rome and its vast empire. He had no rivals left to challenge him. He had avenged his father's death and fulfilled his destiny. He had also destroyed the republic that his father had sought to reform. He returned to Rome as a hero and a savior. In 27 BC, he was hailed as Augustus, the Exalted One. He was granted unprecedented powers and honors by the Senate and the people. He reformed the government, the army, the laws, and the culture. He ushered in a new era of peace and prosperity known as the Pax Romana. But he also established a new system of rule based on his personal authority and influence. He founded a new dynasty that would last for centuries. He became the first emperor of the Roman Empire. He was Caesar. Despite his persona as a ruthless and power-hungry murderer, Augustus' public perception changed in numerous ways. He renounced his dictatorial powers and restored the Republic in name, if not in fact. He respected the rights and privileges of the Senate and the magistrates. He promoted peace and harmony within the empire and with its neighbors. He secured the borders and defended them from external threats. He encouraged trade and commerce, improving the infrastructure and the economy. He supported the arts and sciences, fostering a cultural renaissance. He built magnificent monuments and temples, beautifying the city and honoring the gods. He reformed religion and morality, reviving ancient traditions and values. He was generous to his friends and allies. He pardoned many of his former enemies, rewarding them with honors and offices. He gave gifts and donations to the people, alleviating their poverty and suffering. He was Caesar Augustus, the wise and moderate ruler, a sharp contrast from those who would succeed him. He was revered as a savior and a benefactor. He was worshipped as a deity, a son of a god. He was Caesar Augustus, the greatest of all the Roman emperors. But he was not the only one who claimed to be a son of the divine. He was not the only one who had a mighty plan to fulfill. In a humble town in Judea, a province of Octavius' empire, a child was born. A child who would change the course of history. A child who would challenge Augustus' authority and his legacy. A child who would offer a different kind of peace and salvation. His name is Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph, the son of God, God himself come in the flesh. 
In his pride and ignorance, Caesar Augustus ordered a census of his vast empire, unaware that he was fulfilling a prophecy and setting in motion a divine plan that would send this young couple on a perilous journey to the humble town of Bethlehem, where the king of kings would be born and laid in a manger. A king whose life was radically different than an emperor's. In God's good timing, his eternal decree set forth the annals of history to produce the cradle for an empire that would lead to the cradle the Messiah was then laid in. This Messiah was rejected and persecuted by his own people. He was betrayed by his friends and abandoned by his followers. He was crucified by his oppressors and buried in a tomb. But he did not stay in the grave. He rose from the dead on the third day. He appeared to his disciples and gave them a new mission. He ascended to heaven and promised to return. He is worshipped as the Lord and the Christ. He is celebrated as the King of Kings and the Prince of Peace. He is loved as the Son of God and the Lamb of God. Taking on our frail humanity, he was born in the time of Octavius, Caesar Augustus. But the Son of God is not of this world. Taking on human nature, he was born in the cradle of an empire, yes. But Jesus Christ is above all powers, authorities, republics, and empires. He is before all things and over all things, even a mighty Roman emperor. He is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, ruler of heaven and earth, and lord over an institution that a Roman empire and the gates of hell will never overcome an institution soon to make its appearance on the world stage, the Church. Join me next time as we examine the cultural and religious atmosphere that enveloped the world of the early Church. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you. Feel free to reach out through social media platforms or through email, which you can find in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. And if you enjoyed today's discussion, consider leaving a review. I'm Jared Luchibor. This has been an episode of The Church History Project.